mighty on your truth. Aya, you are mighty on your truth. You are mighty on your truth. Ah, your truth. You are mighty on your truth. You are mighty on your truth. Mighty on your truth. Hello everyone, welcome to the channel. If you're just joining us, welcome. You'll definitely be blessed. Um, on this channel, we're going through the Bible systematically, chapter by chapter. And right now, we're actually in the book of Leviticus. So join us as we progress. So if you've been following the channel, I don't want you to begin to, I don't want you to be confused. So what we've been doing with Leviticus is previously, we've been doing an overview of generally what it means to be a priest, right? So we've not gone into any of the chapters like we did in Genesis and Exodus. And if you notice for those videos that talk about priesthood, right? Um, I titled them Leviticus 1, Leviticus 2, Leviticus 3. And if you, know, if you notice, they are Roman numerals, right? They are not normal numbers. So that that's how I intended it. I intended it not to be chapters. That's why I use Roman numerals. But this video is titled Leviticus chapter 1 because now we're going into chapters. So going forward, um, when you see the Roman numerals, it's just an overview of what it means to be a priest generally. But when you see chapter 1 or chapter 2, then we're going to do a deep dive into each of the chapters. So let's start today. We're going doing Leviticus chapter one. So we'll start by reading the text. So Leviticus chapter one, I'm reading the amplified version. So it says, the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of domestic animals from the herd or from the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall make it, he shall offer a meal without blemish. He shall offer it at the doorway of the tent of the meeting so that he may be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering that it may be accepted for him to make atonement on his behalf. He shall kill the young bull before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall present the blood and sprinkle the blood around on the altar that is at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Then he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priests, shall put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall arrange the pieces, the head and the fat, on the wood which is on the fire that is on the altar for he shall wash its entrails and its legs with water the priest shall offer it all shall offer all of it up in smoke on the altar as a burnt offering it is an offering by fire a sweet a sweet and soothing aroma to the lord but if his offering is from the flock or of the sheep or of the goats as a burnt offering he shall offer a meal without blemish. He shall kill it on the north side of the altar before the Lord. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle his blood around on the altar. He shall cut it into pieces and its, with his head and its fat. And the priests shall arrange them on the wood, which is on the fire that is on the altar. But he shall wash the entrails and legs with water. The priest shall offer it all and offer it up in smoke on the altar. It is a burnt offering, an offering by fire, a sweet, and, a sweet and soothing aroma to the Lord. But if his offering to the Lord is a burnt offering of birds, then he shall bring turtle doves or young pigeons as his offering. The priest shall bring it to the altar and ring up its head and offer it up in smoke on the altar, and its blood is to be drained on the side of the altar. He shall remove its crop with its feathers and throw it next to the east side of the altar in the place for ashes. Then he shall tear it open by the wings, but shall not sever it. And the priest shall offer it up in smoke on the altar. 
on the wood that is on the fire. It is a burnt offering, an offering by fire, a sweet, a sweet and soothing aroma to the Lord. So, the children of Israel had just come out of captivity. They had gotten into the wilderness, and God was now teaching them how to relate with him, right? So he had given them laws, he had given them his Ten Commandments, so he was basically revealing his nature, um, his nature, his character, how he thinks, what he likes, what he doesn't like. And now he was um, instituting a system of sacrifices, right? And somebody, somebody may be wondering why sacrifices? Why would God ask human beings to to bring to come and kill animals and drain the blood and burn them on the on an altar before Him? So the reason is blood is the way that people enter into covenants with spirits, right? The only way you can enter into a covenant with a spirit is through blood. So even people who are on the dark side in their cults who practice witchcraft, they also they always offer sacrifices to whatever demons that they are that they are worshiping, right? Either they kill a goat, they kill a cow, or they, they must kill something, right? It's part of it. That's just how spirits operate. We you enter into a covenant, into a an agreement with the spirit by the shedding of blood. And even we right now, the covenant we have with 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 God, right? is by the shedding of the blood of Jesus. When he shed his blood, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, which he shed for our sakes. So without the blood of Jesus, none of us have a relationship with God because that's just how spirits operate. The covenant or an agreement with the spirit must be done by blood. So the Old Testament, those sacrifices were pointing to the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It was like preparing them to understand, preparing all of us who are, even us who are reading it now, to understand what the sacrifice of Jesus does, how it gives us, a, how it draws us into a covenant, a relationship with God. So what they were doing by this sacrifice is, number one, they were entering into a covenant with God. And what these sacrifices also did was, it gave God a legal right to use the children of Israel. So... They offered those sacrifices not just for themselves, but it covered themselves and it also covered their children. So what it did is it gave God a legal right because they had covenanted themselves to God, right? It gave God a legal right to also use their children. So imagine you're, you're I guess you're a Christian, but even if, let's say you're a Christian and you've given yourself over to the Holy Spirit. So if you open your door and you have children, right? If you open your door one day and you see let's say Jesus has appeared or the Holy Spirit manifested himself to one of your children and your child is now filled with the Holy Ghost and communing with the Holy Ghost. We are not going to be upset. You're not going to be angry. Even if you didn't even pray for the Holy Spirit to fall upon your child. And let's say you didn't even pray. You just opened your door one day and saw that the Holy Spirit had revealed himself to the child. So the reason you're not upset is because you have given yourself over to the Holy Spirit. And because you gave yourself, by extension, you've given your children. So the Holy Spirit can use any of your children. He can reveal himself to any of your children. Because you have covenanted yourself to him, by extension, he can use your children. But if you open your door one day and, God forbid, you see a demon spirit appear to your child, you're going to rebuke it and send it away. And the reason you're going to be angry is because I don't know this demon. I didn't enter a covenant with this demon. I don't have any agreement with this demon. So this demon can't just come and start appearing to my child. They're going to be angry. So the children of Israel, by the time Moses and this set of Israelites who came out of Egypt entered into this covenant, right? They covenanted themselves and by extension, their children to God. So anytime God wants, he can pick any of the children of Israel and make them a prophet. Just the same way when you, when you give yourself to Christ, right? He can manifest himself to your children and you are not upset because he has the legal rights because you gave yourself to him. So God can, the spirit of God can fall upon Elijah or Elisha or Jeremiah or Malachi or anybody who is a child of Israel because by the time Moses and their forefathers made this covenant, by the time they began to offer the sacrifices, he gave God the legal right to use any of the children of Israel. And that's why when you study the Old Testament, Israel was the only nation God used, right? All the prophets came from Israel. Every book of the Bible was written by a Jew, even up to the New Testament. 
So all the prophets were from Israel, the dealings of God were from Israel, the people who God appeared to, the majority of them were all Israelites. So these sacrifices was giving God a legal right to any one of us you want to use, any of our children, any, any one of us use us at any time. So uh, by the way, as we're going through this series, if you have any question, like, so today we're studying Leviticus chapter 1. So if there's anything maybe I said you didn't understand, or if you've read Leviticus chapter 1 by yourself and you have any question, even if I didn't cover it, you can leave the question in the comments and I will cover it by God's grace in the next video. Yeah, so like I was saying, it gave God a legal right to use the children of Israel. So these are the two main reasons why God demanded they offer sacrifices in the Old Testament. So these sacrifices they also offered was, a, was equivalent to worshipping God. So one of the ways they worshipped God was to bring a sacrifice, bring a cow, bring a goat, and give that sacrifice to God. By the time they burn it on the altar, it was a system of worship. And we can see this in, in verses like, in, cha in scriptures like Psalm 141, verse 2. It says, Let my prayer be set before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So if you've not watched um, the video I did on the Tabernacle of Moses, I recommend you watch it, right? It will it's really help you understand many of the things we're going to be discussing in the book of Leviticus. So now we just talked about let your pray, let my prayers ride right before you as incense, right? If you've watched that video, you will know where the altar of incense is and where how the incense was offered. So I, I really recommend you watch that video before you go through this um, before you go through this series on Leviticus. It will truly help you understand. So if you're listening on Spotify, right, you have to not on Spotify. You have to come to YouTube to watch it, and that's because it's a video. It has pictures. It has diagrams, it has representative, visual representations of the tabernacle, of the furniture in the tabernacle, and where everything is. It's something you have to see. It's not something you can just hear. So if you're listening on Spotify, just come to YouTube, type, type my name, and type the tabernacle of Moses. You will find the video. So one of the ways they worship God was, was through sacrifice, right? And these sacrifices are they are a picture of the way we also worship God now. The, when they offer sacrifices, right, you can, as we go through the book of Leviticus, you understand that those sacrifices are a picture of we as a, as a New Testament church, how we worship God. Those sacrifices are a picture of it. So he says, let, let my prayer rise before you as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So he says, when you lift your hands in worship or in praise to God, is the same thing as they offering a sacrifice to God. When it says evening sacrifice, there were two burnt offerings that were offered in the Old Testament. One was offered in the morning, and the, another one was offered at evening, every day. So he says, when you lift your hand, let's say you're in your house, you just want to worship God, and you lift your hand, you say, Father, I bless you. That lifting up of your hands is equivalent to somebody in the Old Testament burning a cow, burning a goat, burning a sheep to God. So our understanding of the sacrifices in the Old Testament and the way these sacrifices were offered and the way that God demanded these sacrifices to be offered will help us in our, in our worship with God. So the first thing, so we're trying to draw some lessons from how they worship God through sacrifices. We're trying to draw those lessons and make them relevant to we as a New Testament church. That's what we're doing now. So the first thing we notice when we read this chapter in Leviticus chapter 1, is that God specifies how he wants to be worshipped. So these are people who just came out of the out of Egypt. They don't know anything about God. And when they approach God, he begins to tell them, this is how I want to be worshipped. So he specifies the kind of animals that he wants to be offered unto him. He says, if any man brings his offering, the offering must be either from the goats, from the sheep, from the cow, or it can be a turtle dog or a pigeon. So those are the only five animals that God wanted um, he wanted to be offered to him as a sacrifice. In other words, they couldn't just worship him anyhow they wanted. Right? They couldn't just come to him and be like, this is how we want to worship you. So you will accept our worship how, however we bring it. 
So God, because he is God and he's a king, he tells you how you should relate with him, right? Not how you want to. You don't relate with God how you feel like or how you want. God specifies how he wants to be worshipped. So there are many people now who just, they see God as this, this, he's just a very loving God, so we can worship him anyhow, right? We can just approach him even if, the way we think, even if the way we are approaching him is not in the Bible, even if it's not specified, as long as it feels good to us, right, then God will accept it as worship. But that's not how it is. God demands, he specifies, he has a way he wants to be worshipped, he wants his, the way he wants himself to be related with. And when you study these sacrifices, you will see that there are, very, there are various rules that govern the way the sacrifices should be offered. So even after they brought the cow and they brought the goat, when they brought it, they couldn't just kill it and just burn it anyhow they want. He now goes into detail. He says, you will lay your hands on the sacrifice, you will cut off the head, you will drain the blood, you will take the fat, right, and you wash the legs, and then you burn everything on the altar. So there are rules that govern how they related with God through the sacrifices. So even us now as a New Testament believer, as New Testament believers, we have rules, right? We have laws, we have commandments, things there, we have boundaries, things that govern the way we relate with God. In fact, any any kind of relationship has rules. There is no relationship that does not have rules, that doesn't have laws, that doesn't have bylaws, boundaries, commandments, ordinances, statutes, things that govern that relationship. So even if it's like a work relationship, the relationship between you and your, your, your employer, your company, for instance, you have rules. Those rules are captured in your terms of employment. So your obligations to them and their obligations to you. So you have policy documents. You have an employee handbook. So your employer doesn't just relate with you anyhow. They have, they have laws. And you don't just come to work and do whatever you want. You also have laws. When you're relating with your friends, you have, you have, even if the rules are not written down, you have, because the person is your friend, does not mean the person can approach you anyhow, do anything to you, misbehave in your presence, and just treat you like a rag. So because the person is your friend, does not mean that they are not expectations. Then somebody, somebody, when you say this, people are always like, you know, this one is a love relationship that is not that, that is a love, a love relationship, so we just approach God, God is just loving, they're just, I'm just like, you have, you need, you need wisdom. Even in loving relationship, there are rules. There are always rules. When you're married to somebody, there are rules that bind to you. There are things you cannot now do because you are married. For instance, a married man, let's say that he, when he was single, he used to come home by 11 p.m. or 10 p.m. every night. Now that he's married, he can't do that. So now that he's married, he, has, he now has a new law that he can arrive home by 10 p.m. He can't just go and hang out with his friends and sit down somewhere and watch football till 10 and leave his wife alone at home. He now has a wife. So whether they wrote that rule down in a book somewhere as these are the 10 commandments of our marriage, is a rule. Whether the guy likes it or not, he has a law now that he has a wife, so he, can, he must come back home on time. When he was single, he spends all his money how he wants. He doesn't tell anybody. He doesn't need to plan with anybody. He doesn't need to confer with anybody. He doesn't need to... I don't know, ask anybody's opinion. It's his money. He spends any, anything he wants to do with it, he does with it. Now he's married. He can't do that. He can't. He's married. So before he spends money anyhow, he now has a wife. They plan the finances together. So it's a relationship of law. But there are laws that bind, that bind it. There are laws. So even in our relationship with God, we have rules. We have laws. There are things that God demands that we do. Just like in a marriage, you demand some things from your spouse. There are things that God demands from us as Christians. So we don't just live our lives anyhow and say God loves us. Therefore, we, do. We're just, we have liberty in Christ and we just, do, just behave anyhow. So even when you love somebody, there are, there are lines they, they should not cross. Right? When you are in a loving relationship with someone, there are lines they should not cross. And if they cross it, you can walk out. And God even gives the authority to walk out. For instance, adultery. He says that if someone commits adultery, you have liberty to walk out of the marriage. So because you love them, does not mean that um, someone can now 
cheat on you today. Then he says he's sorry, or she says she's sorry. Commit adultery tomorrow, commit adultery tomorrow. Then you now stay there and say, I love the person. You can leave, and God don't hold it against you. So even in our relationship with God, there are laws. There are rules. And when there are rules that you can break as a Christian. And the way, you know, I hope you know that marriage is a relationship, is a, is a picture of the relationship that the man has, of relationship God has with us. Because God is the bridegroom and we are the bride. We are married to Christ. Right? So marriage is a picture of the relationship Jesus has with us. So in a marriage, there's a line somebody can cross and God says you can go. So what that is telling you is as a Christian, you can't just live your life anyhow and see that God loves us. There's a line you cross. So anyways, God has rules and regulations that bind us, right? And he expects us to follow those rules as we relate to him. So even though he loves us and we love him, like right? Like we've like we've already established, because his love does not mean that we relate with God anyhow. So for the sacrifices, one of the things God demands is that the sacrifice must be without blemish. That's what he says. Remember that these sacrifices are a picture of worship, right? So he says that if you're bringing your sacrifice, the sacrifice would be, excuse me, without blemish. So a blemish means a spot or a defect, a deformity. So for instance, if you are bringing a sheep, you can't bring a sheep that has spots, right? Um, you can't bring a sheep that has a defect, either it's blind or one leg is longer than one or it has like a sickness or a disease. In other words, the the sacrifice must be perfect, basically. It must be in pristine condition. So even in our worship to God, it shows that our worship to God is something that must be done because bringing a sacrifice without blemish shows that you honor God, right? The fact that a man can have, let's say you have 10 sheep, and all of them are out of the 10, right? Nine of them are limping. So they have a defect with one of their legs, nine of them. And only one of them walks straight. Keep in mind that this sheep, they sold, sometimes they sold the sheep. Or let's say you were, let's say you were planning to sell the sheep. So you have 10 sheep, you are planning to sell them for money. Nine of them have a defect in their leg, they are limping. So those nine of them will not pay you the prevailing market price for a sheep because they are defective. So when you sell them, when you take them to the market, you're going to get, let's say you're only going to get half price because the sheep has a defect. So the only one that will get you the full price for a sheep is the one that is walking on two legs. So the man now has a choice, right? And I honor God with the only one that will actually give me the most money. Or will I go and sell the one that is not defective and give God a defective one? So when he, he, he now decides to bring the particular sheep that is not defective and offer it to God as a sacrifice, that shows that he honors God. It shows that there is reverence for God. So in bringing a sacrifice that is not defective, that is not blind, that is not dead, that is not lean, that doesn't have a disease, right? That is not something you can easily throw away. They bring one of the sheep that is honorable, one of the ones they would have loved to keep for themselves, or one as a pet or something, or one of the ones they would have loved to sell because to fetch you enough money. In sacrificing that one unto God, it shows a level of honor and reverence for God. So in our life, God expects us to honor him with our life. And especially when we're worshiping God, right? Um, when I talk about worship now, right? Worship is two things. So worship is first a lifestyle, right but it's also the act of like singing and dancing maybe in church or in your house or whatever so we'll come to the lifestyle of worship right but now we're talking of like singing and dancing in church so even in that process of singing and dancing in your church or even entering into god's presence whether it's in bible study or in church or even in devotion in your house it must be done with a level of reverence it must be done with a level of honor and this honor is as a result of the revelation you have of God. Let me give you an example. 
Let's say like you have one client you've been chasing. This client is a billion dollar client. You've been chasing this client for like two years, trying to get a meeting, trying to get an appointment because they're very high powered, important client. And for two years, you've been struggling to get this client, to have a meeting with this client. And it's just been difficult. It's just been impossible. You've not been able to get the face to face. Then one day you just receive a call from the client's office and they're like, they are now ready to see you. Keep in mind that this is a billion dollar client, right? And one, if you, if you can secure any sort of business with this client, it will, it will, your budget for the whole year has been accomplished from just this one client or even for two years. So this is a very high power, important meeting with this client. So when you get to the office of this client and you finally, you wait for a while, let's say you, you kept you waiting for like one hour, then the client comes to CEO of this conglomerate, this multi-billion dollar multinational organization. Then some of you are having a meeting and you're beginning to discuss your, your service offerings. If your phone rings, you will not pick it. In fact, if your phone rings, you even apologize. Let's say your, your, your phone is just on the, on the table. And all of a sudden, just when you're like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Let's say one of your friends is calling. You will quickly mute the phone, put it on silent, and put it back inside your bag. But that same person can be in church and open his phone and, and, and be on WhatsApp. In the middle of the service, he will open his phone, go on Instagram, go on WhatsApp, reply to messages, exclude it, and just, and, and just be chilling. So he's ready to honor a client because he can make billions of dollars and fulfill his sales pipeline for the year from one client. He's ready to, he's ready to give him a level of honor. But he doesn't give that same honor to God. He, can be, he won't dare be on Instagram. He won't dare it in the presence of his client. He can never try that. I'll be on Instagram and be scrolling, be opening WhatsApp messages in the presence of his client. But he can be in his devotion or in his church. And in the middle of the service, he will, she will open her bag, bring out the phone, and be scrolling through WhatsApp. And like I said, the reason somebody can do that is that there's a defect in his revelation of who God is. There is a defect. Let me paint a picture for you. So, so let's say you're in the presence of that client, right? That high-powered client. And let's say you came with your <laughs> your seven-month-old baby. It's just an example, but just imagine. So you are in the presence of that client, right? You and you came with your seven-month-old baby. So you. Because you know that this is a very important client, there's a way you comport yourself. There's a level of honor. There's a level of decorum. You don't just misbehave. And you're not misbehaving because you know who the client is. You know his, his stature in the business world. You know the influence, the power, the wealth he commands, and what he can do for your business. So you comport yourself with honor and decorum. But your seven months old baby can scream up and down. He can roll on the table. He can start crying. He can even remove his clothes and be running around the office. And the reason he is doing this is because he has no idea who the client is. He has literally, he doesn't even know, he knows nothing about him. So you comport yourself because of the revelation you have about this man's stature and status in the business world. So that's why you will not pick your phone in his presence. But your baby will misbehave because he doesn't know anything. Let's say now I'm in, I don't know, Barbados. Let's say I went to Barbados. And I saw a man on the street. I can decide to walk past him. Let's say I just saw somebody and I just, I just, I just look at him and walk past and not see anything and not even look at him. So he can even walk past me and say hi. If he says hi to me, I'll say hi and I'll walk past him. But somebody who is a citizen of that country, that same man can walk up to him and say hi. And when the person looks up, right, the citizen and sees the person, he says, your excellence. He bows his head. He says, Your Excellency, Mr. President. He begins to comport himself and behave with honor. So, me, I don't know who that guy is. I lack a revelation of who he is. I'm a Nigerian. So, I don't know who the president of Barbados is. So, if he walks up to me on the street, he says hi, I say hi, and I walk past him with no honor. I won't even look at him twice. But the one who is a citizen of that country, who has understanding and revelation of that man's position of the site, 
if the man comes and says hi, he says, Your Excellency, he bows, he shakes, he stretches his hand, he begins to comport himself. So, the way you behave in God's presence shows the level of revelation you have in God. So, many people have the revelation that God is their father, but they don't have the revelation that God is the king. He's a king. So they lack that revelation. It's not in their they just God loves us and is a father. But the fact that he's a king, they don't have that revelation. So they don't behave themselves like they're in the presence of a king. They, they really don't. They enter into God's presence and they are just careless. They are not, there's no level of decorum. There is no level of honor. Because they, the revelation that this is a king. So I must behave myself honorably. They lack it. That's why you can pick your phone in church. That's why you can be scrolling on WhatsApp in the presence of God. That's why you can be doing your devotion. You can be reading your Bible and in the middle of it, someone will send you a message. You, you close your Bible first. You go and type, type, just reply, then you come back. But if you're with, you're with your boss in the office and you, somebody sends you that same WhatsApp message, you will not leave your boss to reply the message. You and your boss, you and your boss are having a meeting. Then your friend sends you a WhatsApp message. Then you will not tell your boss, wait, let me quickly reply. In the middle of <laughs> in the middle of maybe like your annual meeting or a quarterly meeting, then you tell your boss, let me quickly just with this, my friend. But you can read your Bible, a notification will pop up. Then you, you will now quickly reply the message. Then come back and continue. It's because you, you lack understanding that God is the king. If you are in the physical presence, of God. If you were physically looking at God, physically, you know when you're doing your devotion, it's you and God. If you were physically with God, you will not open your WhatsApp now. Is it because you can't see him? If you were him, let's say you went to heaven and you carried your phone, then you're talking to God. Do you know doing devotion, you're talking to God. Then somebody now sends you a message. So imagine being in heaven, then you now carry your phone. Then because your friend sends you or somebody in your, your one of your colleagues sends you a message, you now quickly, you now tell oh God in the presence of the four living creatures and the 24 others, you say all of you with first. Let me quickly reply this friend. You lack understanding that God is the king. There is no reverence. You see somebody worshipping God in church during worship. <laughs> they now carry their phone. During worship, they carry their phone. They are videoing themselves. This one, they, you know they are jokers. They are very serious jokers. The object of the time... The, the point of worship is to keep your mind fixed on the Lord, to focus on him, to gaze on him, to glorify him in the beauty of his holiness. So your mind is fixed on God when you're worshiping. Once you pick your phone, you're no longer worshiping, you're deceiving yourself. The moment you pick your phone, the, mo the once you just pick your phone, forget it. Your mind has gone. Your mind is no longer on God. In that moment, you've broken the worship. You've scattered it. It's no longer the same. And the height of, in worship that you are supposed to get to, you can never, it will take effort. It will, it's like you are starting again. You take serious effort to get there. Imagine someone worshiping, oh, my mind is on God. Oh, his holiness, his glory, his power, his honor. Then in that moment, you now say, okay, it would be nice for me to quickly video this thing and put it on my WhatsApp videos. The moment you now pick your phone and you do like this, your mind is no longer on God. In that moment, once you start videoing, what you're not thinking is, I hope the lighting in this place is good. Oh, I hope I look good in this photo. Oh, this background. Then you start turning around, start turning the picture so you can capture everybody who is dancing behind you. In that moment, your mind is not on God now. Are you watching God? Yeah, just feel yourself. In that moment, you are thinking of how this will look on your status, how it will look on Instagram, how it will look on WhatsApp. If, if you look fine, if it's capturing the the background well if the if 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 is it if is if you are they are basically evaluating the photo you are taking and how people react to you your mind is not on God you are not worshiping you are deceiving yourself you are utterly deceiving yourself imagine someone that is in the presence of a king a physical king or a president then him and the president are talking then he brings out his phone and say wait let me quickly video myself in this year office, and the president is talking to you. He will never do that. But in God's presence, someone will bring out. You lack understanding. Look at what God says. Malachi 1 verse 8. 
It says, and if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And if you offer the lame for sacrifice, is it not evil? He says, offer it now unto your governor. Will he be pleased with you or accept your presence? So what is God saying that somebody brought a sacrifice to him in the Old Testament? And God said, this kind of sacrifice you brought to me, you won't, if you're a physical governor, you won't give him this thing. You brought a lame sacrifice. You brought a blind goat. He says, if you brought this to a governor, will your governor accept it? Will he be happy with you? So the way you play with your phone in God's presence, if you sat before a governor and you play with your phone like that, I want to send you out of the house. <laughs> will you even dare it? Will you dare it? Will you dare that you are sitting in the presence of a governor? Then you bring out your, your own Instagram at the same time. The way you are doing it in church. Or the way during your own personal devotion, in the middle of devotion, you switch to Instagram, and you come back, you switch, and you come back, you switch to this one, switch to Snapchat, quickly reply one kind of message, and you come back and read your Bible. In the same, in the same thing. Would you do that in the presence of you won't do that in the presence of the God. You won't. So you, you are you are dishonoring God, whether you like it or not. You may say, Oh, it doesn't feel like it. That's your business. It's honestly your business. The fact that you will not do it in the presence of men, either the person is your boss or a governor or a client. But you do it and you do it to God. You are dishonoring God. You are honoring men more than God. Someone goes for an interview. In the interview, in fact, before he enters there, he has put his phone on silent. Before he enters the interview, his phone is on silent. He cannot allow it to ring. Even if it's his mother that is calling him, the mother will wait. When the interview finishes, he'll call his mother back. But someone will be in God's presence, his friend will call him. Or someone will send him a WhatsApp message in the middle of the prayer, the worship, or he's reading his Bible. He will first leave God. You can't do it to a government, but you do it to God. It may not be deliberate, you may not mean it, but the thing is that you lack a revelation of the fact that God is king. Oh, God loves us. It's true. It's true that God loves us. But because God loves us, does not take to remove from the fact that He's a king. Let's say you have a friend, and your friend is the president. Before he became president, you can come, you can tap him and say, hey, oh boy, how are you doing now? You can just come, stretch your hand, shake him, and just play with him anyhow, because he's your friend. But when he becomes president, when you walk into his office, you say, Mr. President. Because he's your friend does not mean that. When you go to his office, you will still pass through the protocols. You will fill the form. You will wait for him to finish a meeting. If he's in the meeting for eight hours, you will wait for him for eight hours. You won't say he's my friend and you just barge into the office. No. No, you still wait. And when you enter, you will treat him with the honor that a president deserves. Even though he's your friend, even if he's your father, if your father is the president, you will still treat him with honor as the president. Even though he's my father, so he's in the middle of a presidential meeting, then you just barge into the office and say, Daddy, this is what I want. That's trash. You give him honor, even if he's your father. Go and study how people related with kings in those days. Even if their father is the king, your father that loves you, when they come, they still bow. The way everybody else bows, he's your father, but he's still the king. So he loves you, you're not afraid, you're not worried, you're not scared of him that he's going to punish you or kill you. But when they enter the presence of the king, even if the king is their father, they bow, they bow their head. And when the king stretches the scepter, that's when they stand up. And even if it's their father, they are free with him. doesn't mean they dishonor him because they're father. So God is your father and he loves you and he's free with you, but I by no means means you treat him with honor, with dishonor. By no means means it by no means means that you now honor men more than you honor God. When I'm reading my Bible, I put up all my notifications. I don't want to see. I truly do not want to see. When I finish, I put them back on. I go and check whatever whatever message I'm, I'm supposed to read. Because in that time, it's an it's between me and my lover. It's an intimate moment. It's one of the only moments I have, just me and God. Because during the whole day, you are busy, people are calling you, everybody, you are, you are people in your face. So you don't really have time. So in that moment where I'm reading my Bible, it's just me and God. It's an intimate moment. I switch off all my Who can now be sending me messages when I'm in an intimate moment with your, with your God? I mean, I don't be the lover of my soul. Then I'll be replying to other people. That's madness. Replying to other people's messages. Imagine you are with your wife. Intimate moment. Be in the bedroom, you and your wife, just two of you, that intimate moment, just two of you, can come and call you there. Then you will now tell your wife to wait. Let me quickly answer my friend. Are you joking? Or you and your wife now say, okay, we're going to have dinner by 8 o'clock. It's just two of us. It can't do late dinner. We've been busy throughout the whole day. Now it's just two of us. Let's just look each other into the eye and appreciate each other. 
So you and your wife are handle that, having that kind of light dinner. Then someone will send you a message on Instagram, then you'll see it. Let me quickly reply, then you come back to your, to your wife. So the times I spend with God, I, I have time between me and the lover of my soul. Nobody can interrupt that process. If I have to wake up earlier than usual so that nobody will call me, it's fine. So if I have to wake up at the time when I know that nobody at all will call me, there is no call that will call me that I have to respond to, I wake up early. And that time, it's me and God. If I'm praying, my phone is also on silent. When I finish praying, I put it off. Or I put it back on. You may say, oh, this is religious. That's your business. The Bible says, them that honor me, I will honor them. God knows them that honor him. It says, them that honor me, I will honor them. So you can do your own anyhow. That's your business. But for honor for God, God knows. So they brought the sacrifices without blemish as a way of honoring God. And that's how we too are supposed to offer our sacrifices to God. So that's talking of sacrifice as worship, right? But in the New Testament, the real sacrifice is you. In Romans chapter 12, from verse 1 to 2, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the message of God, that you offer up your bodies a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. It says you offer up your bodies. So the real sacrifice is you. It's not really when you come and sing and dance in church. It's not really that you paid tithe or you did anything. The real sacrifice is you. Your whole life is a sacrifice. The way you live your life, the way you conduct yourself, your level of holiness, your obedience to the command of God. That's what God is judging. That's what he calls a sacrifice. He says that you offer up your body as a living sacrifice, holy. So what God expects of your life is a life of holiness. That's what he would take as a sacrifice. Remember he says that in the Old Testament, that it should be without blemish. So it should be perfect, no spots, no defect. So what God is expecting from you is holiness. It doesn't mean that you will never sin, right? But what it means is that you will not deliberately sin. If you sin, you fell into the sin. It's not, it's not rebellion that you go and sin today, sin tomorrow, sin today, sin tomorrow. But that's not holiness. That's rebellion. So he says that you offer up yourself a living sacrifice. Holy. He now says acceptable. So your sacrifice cannot can be unacceptable to God. It's not every sacrifice that God accepts. It's not everybody's life that God accepts. That God is happy with. So God loves everybody, right? He loves all of us. He loves us when we sin, even when we don't sin. He loves all the sinners. Even people who have not given their life to Christ, God loves them. But there's a difference between God loving somebody and the person being acceptable to God. You can have a child, you love your child, but if your child is a drug dealer, he's not acceptable. You love him right, but he's a drug dealer, he's not acceptable to you. You don't like what he's doing. If your child is a serial killer, he rapist. An armed robber, a thief. He's not acceptable to you, even though you love him. So God loves all of us, true. But the Bible says holy and acceptable. So some people are not acceptable. And they're not acceptable because of the way they live their lives. Their lives are not holy. This is what many people don't understand when you talk about living a life of holiness. They think, but God already loves us. So they are confused. They're like, if God loves us, why does it matter how I live my life? Why does it matter if I fornicate or I don't fornicate? Or if I lie or I don't lie? After all, God loves me. But you have children that you love and you still want them to behave themselves. So God wants you to behave yourself. You don't say, because I love my child, I should give him instruction and he should not obey. I should be rebellious. I should say, come back home by 6, then he comes back by 12. I should say, do your own work and he refuses to do it. I should give him chores and he doesn't do it. Or I say, don't steal, and it becomes a thief. No. So love does not cop, does not mean that the person's lifestyle is automatically acceptable to God. The, the scripture just says it. Holy, acceptable unto God. So their lives, the way people lead their lives, that are unacceptable. And the only life that is unacceptable to God is the life that is lived in sin. Because it's when it's holy that is acceptable. When you live in sin, your life is not acceptable. When you read the Bible, you see that there are times that people brought sacrifices and God didn't take it. 
For instance, Saul. Saul brought his sacrifice. And God said, obedience would have been better than this sacrifice. It would have been better for you to actually obey him. So his sacrifice was rejected. Remember that in the old sacrifice, the sacrifice was a cow, a goat, a sheep, an animal. But in the New Testament, you are the sacrifice. And it is when you are holy that you are acceptable. So a man can be rejected by God. His life can be unacceptable. God loves him. But God is not happy with the way he is living his life. He doesn't like it. So that man, his life is unacceptable unto God. Even though God loves him. And the issue with a life that is unacceptable. So if you've not watched Leviticus 2, right, please watch it. There are advantages of living a life that is acceptable unto God. There are disadvantages of living a life that is unacceptable. And if you watch Leviticus 2, right, if you haven't watched it, please watch it. You will see the advantages of living a life that is acceptable unto God. So I want to encourage you. If you are living in your sin, God loves you. He doesn't hate you. He loves you. In fact, He doesn't love you more when you do refuse not to sin. Whether you sin or you don't sin, God still loves you. He loves you to sin. But please repent. 